These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Last week, great King Tudhalia managed to turn around the failing course of the Hittite Empire and get us started on a new chapter in Hittite history. This week, we have a new king ascending to the throne, the son of Tudhalia named Arnawanda I. Tudhalia isn't dead, but perhaps he is old, and perhaps he's decided that it makes sense to have one person staying home and managing domestic affairs while the other conducts the ceaseless campaigning expected of a Hittite king. And so we have a dual kingship, one of father and son working together for the good of the empire. However, Arnawanda isn't even king by birth. Instead, he seems to have been a remarkably competent man adopted into the family through a marriage to one of Tudhalia's daughters. This is one of the innovations that will come around during the very best years of the Roman Empire, the practice of kings adopting their successors from the most accomplished men in the empire rather than sticking to strictly blood relations, and has the advantage that matrilocal marriages were a common feature of Anatolian communities, so no one's going to question that Arnawanda was properly part of the dynasty. It is possible that Arnawanda gained prominence during his involvement with the rebellion of the dislocated soldiers that we discussed last episode. It isn't clear what his status was there, whether or not he was already part of the king's household, but it's likely that his success here was part of what secured him the full co-rulership. In any case, the two would reign side by side until Tudhalia's death, and we'll hear no word about any trouble between them. It will, in fact, be difficult to tell who is responsible for what achievements, but my assumption will be that since Tidhalia is a likely a bit older now, he is responsible for the diplomatic and civil affairs while Arnawanda is out fighting. Those civil affairs, though, have two particularly interesting stories in them. One thing that may be causing gossip in the royal court was that Kantu Zili, the man who had murdered King Muatali and won the subsequent civil war, has fallen gravely ill. However, the story of his illness will be saved for next time, since we'll be looking at Hittite medicine in a handful of fun texts, as well as its relation to ritual and religious practice, and how things are all changing here at the cusp of the new Hittite empire. The other story, however, is the perfidy of a vassal named Maduwata. We have a letter written to Madawata himself by King Arnuwanda, possibly during or shortly after the period of co-regency, which gives us a sense of what situation in western Anatolia looks like now that it's been relatively settled down by Tudalia's campaigns. I won't read the whole thing, it gets quite repetitive in places, but the opening as written by Arnuwanda lays out the situation quite plainly. Atreisia, ruler of Ahia, chased you, Maduwata, out of your land. Then he harassed you, and he kept chasing you, and he continued to seek an evil death for you, Maduwata. He would have killed you, but you, Maduwata, fled to my father, and my father saved you from death. He got rid of Atarasia for you. Otherwise, Atarasia would not have left you alone, but would have killed you. Now, when all this occurred is not clear, for we know of two western campaigns by Tudhalia, and neither of them involved the Ahiawans, which is the Hittite term for the Mycenaean Greeks. This Atrasia was likely a minor lord. Perhaps he was the ruler of a small Anatolian kingdom, or perhaps an adventurer from Greece looking to found his own little kingdom. Either way, he decided that Maduata's lands were easy picking. And, sure enough, it turns out they were. The text continues, telling us that Maduata was accompanied in exile in the Hittite lands with a fairly substantial retinue of family and soldiers. But then it was the Hittite army's intervention that saved them from the pursuing Ahiawans. Then Tudhalia had food and supplies gifted to Maduata, which the text goes to great lengths to remind Maduata of, saying... My father saved you, Madawata, you and your family and soldiers. Otherwise, dogs would have devoured you from hunger, even if you had escaped from Atarashia, 
In exchange for protection and supplies, Madawata appears to have sworn an oath to rule as a vassal lord over the land of Mount Zipsala on the western border. Here he would help to defend the Hittite homeland against attack. Tadhalia actually claims he tried to give Maduata a second plot of land, a certain Mount Hariyati, but this place was too close to the Hittite heartland, and Maduata may not have wanted to be so closely observed, since he was already planning his next moves and turned the king down. A part of his obligation as a vassal, which Arnuanda spells out in great detail, is to hold no independent foreign policy, and to hold no lands other than the specific ones the king granted him. However, Madawata uses his new base of operations inside Hittite territory to strike out against a small regional lord named Kapanta Karunta. Even just doing this was a violation of his vassal obligations. But what makes it worse is that Madawata, despite bringing everything who could muster of his own forces and his nearby Hittite forces, was utterly defeated. Not just that, Kapanta Karunta was himself a subject of Arzawa, who the Hittites were meant to be at peace with, and this tiny, selfish conflict drew two full nations into war. Marawata, having lost all but a small handful of men, is said to have crawled naked back into Hittite territory and begged the great king for salvation. Tudhalia smoothed over the diplomatic incident and even managed to get all his captured people back. Though Madawata was strongly rebuked, being reminded that many of these captives should rightfully have been executed under the laws of war, he was still returned to ruling over Mount Zipsala. But this isn't the end of Mudawata's story. For later, Atarasia, the Mycenaean Greek adventurer who seems to have it out for Mudawata, comes to Mount Zipsala. It isn't clear if he's attacking the Hittites or if he's still trying to get some obscure vengeance on Madawata, but whatever the case, Madawata was obligated to stand and defend that territory, but instead he fled without offering even the slightest resistance. Another Hittite general came and saved the day, but there was a fight with some hundred chariots on each side, a modest pitched battle and the Ahiaon was driven off without Maduwata's assistance. For some reason, despite having failed both in not attacking the neighbors and in defending his own territory, which were basically the main two jobs he was given, he was still put back in charge of Mount Zipsala. Then, the Hittites were fighting another conflict in the region, reminding us though the historical annals only record two great campaigns under Tudhalia, there was constant low-level fighting in the area. Marawata was given the task of sending troops against a town called Dalawa to prevent them from sending reinforcements against the main Hittite assault. However, despite having promised to send troops, he stood by and did nothing while the Dalawan reinforcements were able to attack the Hittite flank. It seems that when he was called out for this, he laughed about it, and later made peace with both the city of Dalawa and the lands of Kapanta Karunta while the Hittites were still making war against them. After this, a good chunk is broken, but for some deeply unclear reason, King Tadhalia later gave Madawata another plot of land around the Sianta River in order to act as border guard. But here again, he was out for nothing but personal gain, and finally managed to achieve a certain military success, attacking and conquering the land of Hapala on the other side of the river. But when he took Hapala, he did not turn it over to the Hittite king and acted like an independent ruler, even blocking Hittite troops and messengers from passing through peacefully. Then he started accepting rebels against the Hittite government in his land, protecting them from the great king, and started sending letters to nearby lands to encourage them to turn against the Hittites, spurring them to war against Hittite lands. The indictment of Madawata continues in increasing detail for quite some time, and we're missing the entire final tablet. 
uh, we don't, strictly speaking, know what actually happened to Matawata, or really even why this was written. However, the literary genre of this is perhaps instructive. Hittite treaties often, from this point on, include historical narrative explaining, at least from a Hittite perspective, the facts leading up to the treaty, many of which are quite instructive. It would make quite a bit of sense if this document was either the declaration of war against Matawata's rebel kingdom or the particularly harsh treaty following it. We can't say for certain, but what we can say is that all our talk of major powers skips over quite a bit of action down in the muddled middle, who, aside from unusual cases like this and last week's tale of Idrami, seems to have been having quite a lot of action all to themselves. Now, for those who play video games, the situation here seems to have been much less like a game of civilization and far more like Mountain Blade or perhaps Crusader Kings, with quite a bit being driven by the action and mistakes of people very far down the noble hierarchy. But though the tale of Madawata reflects just how hard it could be for Tudhalia to keep control over his kingdom, he still has a few more triumphs left in him. After building it up so much last episode, we finally get to let our king, along with his new son and regent, look east and address the Hurrians of Mitanni. Currently, they're led by one of the few Mitanni kings that we can put a name and date to, the impressively villainous-sounding Shaushtatar. He has, while the Hittites have been busy consolidating, brought Mitanni to its greatest height. It is he who helped Idrimi become a local power, and he who helped turn Kizawatna from the Hittite side, and he who, on the other side of his empire, sacked the city of Asher, ensuring that there were no more rivals for domination of North Mesopotamia. Most critically, though, Shaushtatar was probably the king who ordered the retributive sack of Isua, after the Hittites took control of the border region last episode. Though we only have Hittite accounts of the affair, and they have every reason to be exaggerating the severity here, it seems that Isua was plundered quite brutally for the crime of having been conquered by an enemy force. This had ripple effects throughout the Mitanni vassals, for it was primarily the duty of the overlord to be protecting these lands, and it could well have been seen that Isua was being punished by the king of Mitanni for failing at something that was properly the Mitanni king's job in the first place. It's impossible to say how far the ripple effects spread from this one decision, but we know for certain that Kizawatna, which a century ago had split from the Hittite Empire and only a generation ago gone fully over to the Hurrian side, is now begging the Hittite king for a treaty, even one where Kizawatna is a subject far less than the parody treaties it once enjoyed. There are still elements of equality here, and it's worded in a way very respectful to both kingdoms, but overall there's no doubt who's in charge in the new relationship. This was a big break for Tudhalia. The land of Kizawatna was not just another vassal kingdom, it was the critical gateway into Syria, and its loss generations ago had put a damper on any plans to expand in that direction. And soon enough, the army was raised and marching through the Cilician gates. Their goal was Syria, and their target specifically was the city of Aleppo, now deep in Mitanni territory. Subsequent campaigns appear to have lasted for years and repeatedly pushed back and forth, but at some point Tudhalia, or more likely his younger co-king and son Arnawanda, took the th local throne in Aleppo itself, installing a loyal vassal as king and making a peace with the conquered cities, bringing them into the Hittite sphere. This was strongly contested by the Mitanni and their famous Marianu charioteers, but it seems that in the end, the Hittites emerged triumphant. Later kings claimed that Tudhalia utterly destroyed the Mitanni, but this is simple exaggeration. Still, even after the fighting was over, at least for the most part, the battle for Syria never seems to have stopped completely. 
The local governors on both the Hittite and Mitanni side of the border were constantly raiding their neighbors, grabbing chunks of territory for themselves and indirectly for their sphere of influence. And it's hard to think that they went completely unsupported by the great powers in all this. But it wasn't just violence that redrew the Syrian border in this turbulent time. Each governor had a choice in which side he wanted to back, based on local strategic positions and his own diplomatic condition. We have reports of the various towns around Aleppo petitioning the Hittite government to be granted control over various bits of land, claiming all sorts of reasons, like restitution for a previous raid, or that Aleppo is being disloyal again. It's hard to sort out all of it, but it seems like just in Arnuanda's lifetime, Aleppo may have either switched sides or been conquered two or three times each time destabilizing the power balance in the region. Still, while this wasn't the great expeditions of the now legendary Hattushili and Mershili, Tudhalia's final campaigns re-established the Hittite Empire as a force in the Near East, now splitting and competing over the main battleground of Syria alongside the Mitanni and Egyptians. Tudhalia died of natural causes, and rule transitioned smoothly over to his son and co-ruler Arnawanda at this point, with very little shift in policy between them. If you take a look at the map posted in the show notes for this episode over on oldeststories.net, it looks like the Hittites now control a fairly vast sweep of territory. And for sure, there is no mistaking that they're doing much better than they were before Tadhalia came to the throne. However, a great deal of that apparent success is more ephemeral than it seems. In the West, We've seen with the affair of Maduata that independent rulers were quite happy behaving independently, with almost no regard to their nominal Hittite overlord. While Maduata was almost certainly an extreme example, we know that in Syria as well, many of the vassals switched sides on a somewhat regular basis. But perhaps worst of all, as he begins to take sole authority over the Hittite kingdom is the situation in the north, where the Kaskans have been taking advantage of the Hittite preoccupation with Syria to devastate many communities. Unlike the Hittites, the Kaskans had no respect for temples, and a prayer from the royal household for the north still survives. The prayer lists a number of places that have been lost to the northern barbarians, then says... The temples which you, the gods, possessed in these lands were sacked by the Kaskans. They smashed the images of you, the gods. They plundered silver and gold, household objects of silver, gold, and bronze, and sacred implements of bronze. Of your holy garments, the Kaskans took them for themselves. They scattered the priests and the high priests, the mothers of God, the anointed, the musicians, the singers, the cooks, the bakers, the plowmen, and the gardeners, and made them their slaves. Thus it has come about in these lands that no one invokes the names of you, the gods, any more. No one presents to you the sacrifices due to you daily, monthly, and yearly. No one celebrates your festivals and pageants. Despite the outrage of these attacks, which certainly had a substantial human toll beyond just the things taken from the houses of the gods, Arnawanda simply had too many fires to put out all of them, and sent out a flurry of diplomatic communications, concluding treaties with numerous tiny tribes and kingdoms on all sides of his borders. Many of these treaties were not worth the clay they were carved in, though, and we hear in particular of a lord named Mita from the town of Pahua as an example of what may have been a frequent occurrence. Mita, despite his treaty obligations to the Hittites, was trying to play both sides by securing himself a royal marriage with a nearby town that was nominally at war with the Hittites. For the offense of trying to manage his local affairs independently, Arnuanda demanded his removal, sending a formal letter of indictment detailing many actions that Mita had taken which undermined Hittite authority. 
His ultimate fate is also unknown, but it seems likely that he shared a fate with Matawata, though whether that shared fate is being ignored because there's simply too much instability within the kingdom, or if it is swift kingly justice cannot be known. This document, however, does end with a note that if the city as a whole does not hand over Mita, then Arnuwanda will be marching his army over there post-haste. Either way, the fact that we can see some of the internal weaknesses of the Hittite Empire, which you'll remember has never in its history been a model of stability, does not mean that the Hittite Empire was actually weak, or looked weak to its neighbors. Indeed, by focusing hard on the Syrian push, Arnawanda was able to make it all the way to the Kabur region and take the city of Washakani, which is suspected to have been the Mitanni political capital. But this very success would come to cause problems for the Hittites. Since 1450, Egypt and Mitanni had been enemies, battling diplomatically and through small-scale wars over the cities of Syria. However, this new and rising threat to the region convinced Pharaoh Amenhotep III and the Mitanni king Artatama that fighting each other was a distraction when they could instead be allied against the Hittites. And so, sometime around 1410 BCE, the situation in Syria stalled out almost completely. There was no more opportunity for the Hittites to attack further without risking dangerous retaliation, while at the same time the Mitanni were on the back foot and the Egyptians were preoccupied with another transfer of power. With little ado in terms of continuing to expand, Arnawanda went back to Hattusha and spent his final years engaged in quite a lot of writing. He may have begun rewriting some of the old kingdom laws which had governed the kingdom since Hattushili, and as was mentioned, he's in constant correspondence with vassals and minor lords throughout the Near East and Anatolia, keeping them in line or trying to calm them down. But most significantly, he wrote down instructions for his subordinates. We have at least a dozen which survive in good order and tell us a remarkable amount of what was expected of a governor and, indirectly, what that governor's daily life may have looked like. There are a number of these, some of which were likely written by Arnuanda's father, Tadhalia, but taken together, it represents a concerted effort towards systematizing government in the Hittite Empire. It seems, however, that Tudalia didn't just start writing these decrees because he was personally inclined in that direction. One of the more interesting fragments is a set of instructions on local law, which begins by saying, Thus says the sovereign Tudhalia, great king, Once I destroyed Ashua, I came back to Hattusha. And you'll recall that this was his first major campaign, fairly early in his reign. And I provided for the deities, so that all the men would revere me. And they spoke to me, saying, You, your majesty, our lord, you are a campaigner, and so you have not been able to render judgment in certain law cases. While you are away, evil persons have utterly destroyed many things. Chaos has seized the land holdings, and many troops have disciplinary issues outstanding. The situation in general has become awful. And so, it's in response to this plea that Tudhalia began with a set of written instructions to judges, or to whoever was going to adjudicate the law. Many of these are pretty typical, and we've seen them in the discussions of the old Hittite laws, though Tudhalia focuses much less on monetary compensations to victims and far more on blindings and executions as punishments. But apparently, like we saw when discussing the Nuzi texts in the Mitanni Empire, corruption was a massive problem throughout the kingdom. A specific instruction is laid down around the royal grain storage pits, where tax collections would be kept, and to be distributed out to the temples, soldiers, and other royal priorities. It very specifically says that no one shall open these storage pits of their own accord. Anyone opening it without royal authorization is to be seized and tortured 
Another instruction in the same set of criminal reforms states that if anyone impedes a royal investigation in any way by lying or hiding or anything else, then the man must be executed. A line at the end appears to say that even the king himself is not allowed to change the man's fate. One of the earliest places in human history where we see evidence that the king is beneath the laws he enforced. This idea was actually started, at least in the Hittite context, by Telipanu when trying to end royal bloodshed by applying the laws against murder to the king himself at least when the victim is another king. And clearly the idea of laws greater than any man is really starting to take off here, at least a little bit. We see this primacy of the rule of law in the frequent repetitions in these instructions that the chain of command must be followed. For those responsible to muster troops on command, they must muster when and where ordered. They must not hold back on campaign, and if they hear anyone plotting sedition, they must report it. Indeed, we've already seen the problem of vassal rulers refusing to attend Hittite musters or holding back in the fighting, like Madawata, and this repeated emphasis on reporting any traitorous speech, or even speech that suggests anything the king might dislike, is on paper a remarkably broad censorship decree, though it's likely that it gets repeated so often because it was essentially unenforceable. It's also quite likely that these instructional texts are valuable both for showing us how things were supposed to be done and also for telling us in the things that get frequently repeated across texts what issues the king often has with his vassals. One thing we see, not among lords, but in instructions to enlisted men, is that they are ordered to gather when required by the king. In the instructions for lords, the king emphasizes how the lords absolutely must show up when summoned. With the instructions to the men, however, this isn't emphasized. Instead, he emphasizes how they must stay until whatever work is done, either until the campaign is finished or until the work project is completed. Once it is completed, the king will perform an oracle, and only when the gods say it's allowed can the men return home. This is something like a teacher in a classroom emphasizing that the children are to stay at their desks until the bell rings and the teacher releases them, and the repeated emphasis that the men should stay until released suggests to us that this was a systemic issue in the Hittite Empire. Just to give you an idea of what I mean by emphasizing, you can hear it for yourself at the end of one instruction text called Tudhalia's Instructions for His Men. Furthermore, last year you arrived at the city of Kiliman, and you commanded the men who were your subordinates thus, saying, Eat all of your government-provided soldier bread immediately, but do not do the work, and then you released the men. Then, because of that matter, you fell short of your provisions and caused problems elsewhere. Whoever does such a thing in the future, let the gods of this oath which he swears to me now, let them grab him and let the gods destroy him, along with his wife and sons. Moreover, let the matter of government issue soldier bread be a binding obligation from this moment on. When they mobilize an army for a campaign, let a clan chief and a commander both inspect the soldier's bread and the flour. He who does not have enough soldier bread, though, will not undertake campaign. Do you not even know the matters of campaigning? Because of such matters, transgressions have occurred. The next part is fun, too. Furthermore, whoever is appeasing the enemy, and even speaks like this, saying, Maybe this war will be lost, or even if he says, I hope this war does not escalate. Then let the gods of this oath grab him and destroy him along with his wife and sons. And these obligations that I, my son, am imposing on you, let them be important to you. That which I have placed in your hands, accomplish every last bit of it. Let also my benevolence in no way diminish." These general instructions, repeated frequently, give us a sense of how the Hittite Empire was really built.
like many Bronze Age empires, it wasn't a great monolithic state like a modern country. It wasn't even as cohesive as the Egyptian nation at the same time. The great king was mostly the boss of a bunch of tiny kings, and then only as long as those tiny kings felt that the great Hittite king could keep them in a line. Tudhalia and Arnawanda did what they could to manage this system, and through these instructions attempted to regulate things as best they could. But though this period of the Hittite Empire sees some success, and soon enough we'll be seeing the Great Hittite Golden Age, they never really transitioned out of this intensely personal style of empire, and never really stop experiencing the downsides of disloyal little men making up the million building blocks of the Hittite imperial patchwork. Comparisons to feudal Europe or the Holy Roman Empire of the Middle Ages are not quite exact for a number of reasons, but as a first approximation, it can at times feel quite similar. But it's some of these, particularly the instructions directed at very particular positions, we can see a reflection of the daily life of these middle administrators, people that don't usually show up in royal archives except as names, and whose lifestyles and work habits are nearly invisible in the archaeological record. Something like Arnawanda's instructions for the mayor of Hattusha, for example, paint a picture of a man given very particular responsibilities in the overseeing of the town. He has, as you might expect, the responsibility for ensuring that the guards are kept posted at all important parts along the town wall at all times, and for overseeing the city commissioners who undertake a number of civil functions within the town, as well as the management of heralds, water supplies, and watchfires. Most amusingly among his oversight functions, an instruction reads, if the city commissioner does not patrol Hattusha every two or three days, and someone says to the mayor, Oh, a corpse is laying up on the streets over in whatever place, then the mayor shall catch the city commissioner in his negligence. I find this morbidly hilarious. Apparently dead bodies were such a common occurrence in Hattusha that it was part of the city commissioner's job to dispose of them. And after only a few days, one could discover if a commissioner was making his rounds based on whether or not there were a ton of just dead bodies laying out in the streets. This begs the question of whether Anatolia in general had just poor solutions for dealing with dead people, or if Hattusha was some uniquely dangerous Bronze Age slum. I don't actually think this is something we can say for sure one way or the other, just some possibilities. The mayor also had a personal responsibility for a number of tiny, fiddly things of particular importance, most notably his role in every single day, opening and closing of the main gates of the city, taking heightened ritual care to keep track of the door bolts every day. And his instruction tablet ends with a number of warnings against embezzlement, such as when carpenters are employed for the maintenance of city and royal projects, they are not to be used in the mayor's personal house, with similar injunctions listed for a number of similar professions when employed with government money. Of course, these same sort of laws still exist in modern countries and mayors and governors in certain states and U.S. territories still have the same sorts of trouble with them that these Hattusha mayors likely had 34 centuries ago. If these sorts of little historical details really interest you, one of the most interesting and complete texts details the entire regular schedule for a so-called Lord of the Towers which sounds a bit more Lord of the Rings than it really is. It's the instructions for a regional governor in the Northlands, where all the villages were fortified against near ceaseless cask and raids. From reading this, you can really get a picture of a man whose job kept him continuously on the move, inspecting one thing after another, and telling how a military province should be run down to certain tiny details. But this sort of text deserves more attention than I'm going to give it on this show, since it would take a while and be a bit more detail-oriented than I think many listeners will be interested in.
And so if that sounds interesting to you, I've posted a link to a quite readable translation from the now sadly defunct website Hittites.info. The link is in the show notes for the episode over on oldeststories.net. With the transition from King Arnawanda to his successor, Tudhalia II, the Hittites are about to get into their most interesting and well-documented period, the rise of the Hittite New Kingdom, or Hittite Empire, goes by a lot of different names. However, we would be remiss if we did not pause for a moment and look at some of the great changes going on within the kingdom before returning to our action movie narrative. Because it turns out that the Hurrians have not just been dominating politically for the last century or two, but they've also been pushing into Anatolian culture and religion as well. And so, while in two weeks we'll be getting to some high political drama, Next week, we'll be focused on science and magic and how, for the Hittites, those were basically the same thing. So join us next time for prayer, witchcraft, and hygiene standards that would not be out of place in a modern hospital. Thank you for listening.